Son's name, Jesus. Amen. Morning, guys. You guys want to stand up and we'll have some time worshiping. Beautiful weather out there today, huh? Thank you. 
just love you and thank you that we will never ever be forsaken by you. That you know us, that you love us. We just want to draw near to you, God, because you draw near to us. We love you so much.
Excellent. So, uh, you know, that's all right. That's <laughs> all I need. Um, normally, we do uh, family services here where, where kids are welcome, and, and they are. They're welcome today. I just want to give a brief kind of disclaimer that we are going to get into some more heavy topics today. So if you don't want your little ones to be exposed to it, talking about it, that is okay. I'm just giving you a little bit of a warning. But we're in kind of a heavier part of history right now. And I think it's important that we address it, that we talk about it, and uh, move forward together as a church, hopefully in unity. I know these are divisive topics. Hopefully in unity, or as much unity as we possibly can have in situations like this. And so I was going to finish uh, my sermon series on the vision of the church and what we are about, but... Uh, again, given recent circumstances, I think it's important that we talk about it. We do talk about it. These are, these are things that unfortunately can serve to divide us where they shouldn't. And I, I'm hoping that after today, like I said, even if you don't agree with me, hopefully we can have some amount of unity together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you have your Bible, please flip them open to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to start in verse 3. This is going to be the main passage we're going to meditate on today together. And it says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're grateful for you. I do pray that as we study your word, study your scripture, give us insight into what's happening around us. Give us insight into how we should respond and how we should be feeling about current events, that we might honor and glorify you even in the midst of darkness, maybe especially in the midst of darkness. We love you, Lord, and in your name. Amen. All right, so 
I'm not going to be getting into the specifics of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If you guys want information on that, there are many pastors that have released information on those things that you could look up this week, and they've done a far better job than I ever could. Uh, my uh, well, it kind of seems weird calling him my former pastor. My, my former pastor, Scott Richards at Calvary Christian Fellowship, he's released a series of videos on his YouTube channel, Reason for Hope, where he dives into it and gives a biblical and prophetic perspective. Skip Heitzig out of Calvary, Albuquerque, has also given sermons on it, and he has uh, interviewed guys like Joel Rosenberg, who uh, lives in Israel and has a ministry called the Joshua Fund that gives aid to Israel that was really excellent, as well as Dr. Michael Brown. He has a ministry out of South Carolina, and he's a Messianic Jew who gives a very interesting perspective on these things as well. But that's not really my purpose today. Where I'm going to be coming from is I'm going to be pulling from my experiences as a veteran to help frame the current conflict on the backdrop of what we can call the grand conflict the massive conflict that's always happening behind the scenes, and that is the conflict between the rebellious demonic forces of Satan and the faithful angelic forces of God. And this is what you would call a proxy war on that landscape. Right? Evil has come out, and we've seen it, and it's very disturbing to us. And that's, I think, an important thing for people of the West to remember. Um, Oftentimes, because we live in such a massively blessed society, and we really do, um, I am thankful for the country that I live in. I've been able to visit other parts of the world and see that the culture that we have truly is a miracle. And it's beneficial that we get to be a part of it. And you've got to realize that the, the feelings, when hopefully if you watch some of the footage, hopefully you didn't watch some of the footage, of decapitated infants and rape victims and things that are happening in Israel that we just can't fully wrap our minds around. Hopefully you met it with the same kind of disgust and scorn and grief that I did and so many others did. And you have to remember that emotional reaction you have is a product of the culture you grow up in. What you got to witness is warfare. And it, unfortunately, is how countries have conducted warfare for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's horrible, and it's evil, and it's awful, but we live in the first society ever that has come up with rules of warfare, things that we do not do even to our worst enemies. That has not existed in human history. That is a novelty in human history. And I served... The Marine Corps, I served this country, I did two combat tours to Afghanistan, and we had rules of how we treated those people. We did not abuse their citizens. We did not abuse their civilians. We tried our best to defeat the enemy without touching them. And that is, I'm thankful for that, I'm thankful I got to be a part of that, but it is something that those who are opposed to us as a country do not share. And we're going to study and explain why that is. Now, if you notice in the passage that I read to you, it may sound interesting, but Paul, the Apostle Paul, sitting in one of the most evil empires that apparently every man thinks about every 30 seconds, the Roman Empire, and he's sitting in the midst of this evil empire, and he, he says, we do not fight against flesh and blood. Our enemies are not the Romans. Our enemies are not these people who are throwing us in prison and trying to kill us. They're, it's not the Romans. It's not their military. It's not their government. That's not the problem. He says there's something behind them that we actually are fighting, and it is the source of actual evil. And he says these forces, these nefarious, wicked forces, exist not in a plane that we can see, but they exist in the plane of our imaginations. They exist in our minds, in our thoughts. That is how Satan and the demons are able to touch this reality. Right? They're not corporeal. They don't have bodies, but they are purely conscious beings. And it means that if they can touch us, they touch us in our minds. And interestingly knowing these things about me, it might surprise you, it might not, but I've always been fascinated with evil. 
I've always been very fascinated with the concept of evil from a very young age. And I studied in high school serial killers and mass murderers and people that have done really, really atrocious things. And I think a lot of us do. I think it's like a spectacle for a lot of Americans. That's why CSI is on like its 40th season and it's been in Miami and every other city is because there's something about evil that pulls us. That, that's why we dedicate an entire day to just fixating upon evil, wickedness. It's like a car crash. It's something that pulls our attention, but it also disgusts us simultaneously. It's, it's, it's got a very interesting feel to it. And what I'll tell you is in the, in the West, we are very naive to where evil comes from. We think, genuinely, we think that evil only has two sources. We think it either comes from mental insanity or it comes from oppression. So somebody has lost it, they've gone crazy, and that's how we explain Dahmer, that's how we explain H.H. H. Holmes and all these other mass murderers. And, or we say, well, they're a victim of oppression, and that's why they did what they did. But biblically, we see that evil is something that doesn't exist out there, but it exists in our hearts. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he was a survivor of the gulags that were set up in Soviet Russia. And uh, in his very interesting book, The Gulag Archipelago, he says, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties, but right through every human heart. Even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, there will be one small bridgehead of good. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains an uprooted small corner of evil. Thanks to ideology, it's key, the 20th century is fated to experience evil doing calculated on a scale of millions. What's he saying? He's saying that we are born fallen. We are image of God. So we have a character and a conscience that reflects the goodness of God and wants to preserve life and wants to serve and obey the God of the universe. But we are fallen at the same time. And our fallen nature is at odds with our given nature, our God-bearing image nature. And because of that, we're susceptible to being trained in our consciences. And ideas do that. So, when I say that warfare has always happened in this way, you have to understand, study history and realize militaries have almost always conducted themselves this way. As gruesome and as ghastly as it is, they almost always have conducted themselves in this way. And you cannot explain away the brutality that you saw last week on insanity or oppression. An entire nation can't go crazy. An entire civilization can't lose their minds. And when you read their writings, you realize these are not crazy people. These are people who are very sane, who believe a very evil ideology. That's what we're looking at. Ideas give permission to the conscience to conduct the evil that we want. There is a uh, really interesting experiment. I'll, I'll lighten the mood a little. So Dan Ariely, he is a, uh, a bit of a sociologist. He's out at Duke University. Really fascinating guy, really bright. And you can probably tell from his name, Jewish just like many of the brilliant people in our culture and world. But he conducted an experiment to figure out where lying comes from. And so he set up these centers that you can go to. And when you go there, they will give you a test. And it's self-examined, meaning that you take the test, and then they put the answers up on the screen, and you score yourself. And then they tell you, go to the back of the room and shred your paper. And come to the front and tell us how many you got right, and for every one you got right, you'll get some money. And so he wanted to see how people lied. And so what he did is he rigged the shredder to only shred the sides, but it left the center intact. So now guess what they get to do? They get to test to see how many people lied. And what they figured out is basically everybody lied about one or two. Everybody was like, yeah, I got, I got 10 right, when really they got nine right. Pretty much everybody did that. There was a couple big liars, 
But for the most part, there was only a very small segment of, I am sorry, virtually everyone gave a small amount of deception within their answers. So he wanted to figure out, how do I get those numbers to go up? How do I get people to lie more? So the first thought he had was incentive structure. Let's give more money per right answer. So instead of like a dollar, he gave like $10. And what he found out is surprisingly, lying did not go up, lying went down. So he kept trying to mess with the experiment because that threw off his whole theory. And then he came up with an idea. So he said, for every answer you get right, half goes to charity and half goes in your pocket. So you get like $10, but half goes to charity, half goes in your pocket. Lying skyrocketed in that instance. And obviously in your mind, you're like, well, if those people could have always given their money to charity. So why, why, why is the promise of giving the money to charity make people lie more? And he, he said this, it seems as though lying corresponds deeply to our ability to justify our deception. In other words, what he's saying is we all want to look in the mirror and think of ourselves as good people. But you realize that your culture has given you a lot of the standards of goodness that you value. And when you stand in the mirror, you're judging yourself based on a standard of righteousness, of goodness. And we can all get away with a little bit of bad and still think of ourselves as good. But the more bad you do, the less ability you'll have to justify your behavior. It may be surprising to a lot of people when they saw those in Hamas not crying or weeping over what they did, but videotaping it and celebrating it and posting it as a victory. Again, I did two combat tours, and we were racked with grief over what we saw and did. I did not come home and throw a party. I didn't take video of what we saw. I protected those who were at home from what I saw. Because I understood that what I saw was not glorious. They could be behind the ideology that we were supporting over there, but there's no way that they would be okay with war because it's evil. It can be used to accomplish good, but it is in its nature evil. Warfare is evil. It is the taking of life. How can a group of people not only do what they did, but celebrate it? I guarantee you none of them are getting PTSD. And it's because there is something in their belief that allows themselves to see their behavior as good. That is why they say, Allahu Akbar, when they kill people. Praise be to God. I was a Christian when I was in the military. I never praised God when I fought the Taliban. Even though I believed what I was doing was right. I never praised God because I saw it as bad the whole time. So I'm going to read you their ideology so you understand this. This is from their charter, and a lot of it is propaganda, and a lot of it is garbage, but there's truth here, and we need to listen to it. This is in the preamble of their charter. It says, Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it. Later on, in Article 1, they say, we derive all of our beliefs from Islam. From it, we draw our ideas, ways of thinking, and understanding of the universe, life, and man. It resorts to it for judgment in all its conduct, meaning their conduct, and by it, we are inspired for our guidance and our steps. So what is in Islam that would make that okay? Well, Article 7. The Islamic resistance movement aspires to the realization of Allah's promise, no matter how long that should take. The Prophet Allah, bless him, grant him salvation, has said. Now, I'm about to read this. This is from the Hadith literature. This is scripture for Muslims. It's on top of their Quran. It's equal to their Quran and scripture. This is something that Muhammad said. They have what, they, what we call in Christianity, we call it eschatology, a study of the last days, when Jesus will come back. Muslims have an eschatology. Some people don't know that. They believe Allah will return with Muhammad. Well, when will Muhammad return? Well, he tells them, he told his followers when he'll return. The day of judgment, when he'll come back, will not come 
until Muslims fight the Jews, killing them until the Jews hide behind stones and even the stones and trees will say, O oh Muslim, kill this Jew that is behind me. That's when Muhammad will come back. That's in their scriptures. Now, it doesn't mean there can't be good Muslims. There are plenty of good Muslims. I had many conversations with a friend of mine who was a Muslim and who was a sheikh at a local, um, I mean, I'm sorry, a mom at a local mosque. And I asked him about these passages, and he says, well, we, we don't believe that anymore. I said, well, why don't you believe it anymore? He says, well, we don't have a caliph anymore. The Ottoman Empire was the last caliph, and it, it fell after World War I. And he said, so that, that doesn't apply to us anymore. I said, well, what if you get another caliph? He said, well, then that would apply again. Don't you realize that all these terrorist organizations believe that they are caliphs? They say it in their writings. There, there's a little bit of a civil war happening in Islam, but all of these terrorist organizations believe that they are the new caliphate that will join Islam. Read their charter. They say it explicitly. Hamas believes that they are the new caliphate. They ask for all Muslims around the world to join them in what they're doing. That idea... That wicked idea is something that is moving a people. And it's moving them to varying degrees and levels. And as Christians, we have to understand that is our enemy. It's not people. It's not the Muslim people. It's not the Muslim governments. It is an idea. And that idea is wicked. And I... I realized that on my first deployment, I remember I was standing on post and I looked out and I saw this, um, as a dad now, it hits me a little harder, but I, I saw this little girl, little five-year-old girl, just cutest thing you'd ever see. And she, she drove by my post and she, she gave me a little wave and I waved back. And it just, it just hit me that this girl is being raised in a culture that has actually circumcised her that will marry her off at the age of 12, probably to a 50-year-old, in which she will be one of a couple wives, and she will spend her life basically doing that as a second-class citizen. And which, by the way, in the Quran, it is okay to beat your wife. That's in Surah 4, if you want to read it on your own time. And I realized, like, I can take out all the Taliban, which is what my mission was, and yet this idea is still there in the culture. And it is an enemy. It is a source of evil. And we have to be aware of that. If you're not aware of that, if you're not aware that our warfare is not with flesh, you will become a racist. There's no way around it. And we have a different type of racism that is accepted right now, and it is called the soft bigotry of low expectations, in which we look at people doing things like this and like, oh, well, you know, that's, that's just their culture, and, you know, they've been oppressed for so many years, and wouldn't you do the same thing? And the answer is no, I wouldn't do the same thing, and neither would you. And the fact that you don't judge their behavior tells me that you're a racist. You hold them to a lower standard of behavior than anyone else on earth. And you don't do that to the Israelite army, by the way. You hold them to the same standard as everybody else, to a higher standard even, in most cases. And there's something wrong there. If you don't understand that the problem is an ideology, racism is a natural conclusion to come to. It must be them. It must be something in their DNA that is causing them to behave like animals. And it's not. It's not their DNA, it's not their biology, it's not their center of gravity or their land mass. It's an idea. Just like what is making you appalled by that is not your ethnicity either. It's an idea that has captured you. An idea that says that we're all made in the image and likeness of God. And no matter how wicked somebody becomes, it is never a good thing to take their life. Never. It might be a necessary thing, and that's something we could debate, but it is never a good thing. 
because we're image bearers of God. Now, something that the West is also not seeing that an atheist saw. This is a Friedrich Nietzsche, probably the brightest philosopher in the last 300 years, but uh, an atheist, as I said, and didn't like Christianity. But he saw something that his contemporaries did not see in the 1800s. And this is from his book called The Gay Science. And he gives a story of a madman. He says, a madman jumped into the midst of like basically these college professors and transfixed him with his glances. Where is God? He called out. I mean to tell you, we have killed him, you and I. We are all his murderers. What did we do when we loosened this earth from its sun? God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we console ourselves, the most murderous of all murderers, the holiest of, and the mightiest that the world has hitherto possessed? And he has bled to death underneath our knives. Who will wipe the blood from us? Is not the magnitude of this deed too great for us? Shall we not ourselves have to become worthy, have to become gods merely to seem worthy of this? There never was a greater event, and on account of it, all who are born after us belong to a higher history than any history before us. So even an atheist understood something. Christianity, love it or hate it, is the greatest system of morality, ethics, and religion that has ever existed. So he didn't believe in Christianity, but he recognized that. And he was telling his fellow atheists, if you get rid of God, don't you realize that you get rid of the morality that was built by belief in him? And if you do that, you don't go back to paganism, which you have unjustly glorified. And we'll talk more about that in a second. You go on to something worse. And it's not clear what he's talking about, but I genuinely believe he's actually talking about Marxism. I think he was really afraid of Marxist ideas that were permeating his culture. Remember, Marx was a German, just like Nietzsche. And he was worried about what that would do. Do you realize that in the 1900s, more people were killed under that ideology than any century prior? Again, what idea could make it okay for people like Mao Zedong, who killed tens of millions of his own people. What idea can make it okay for Joseph Stalin to kill tens of millions of his own people, for Pol Pot to kill millions of his own people? What idea could possibly make you think that that's okay? Well, it's an idea that doesn't come before God. It's an idea that comes after God. Only an idea that comes after God could be that wicked. And we have to realize, as a culture, that we have something coming before and after us that has surrounded us on all sides and hates us. There is an ideology that's come after us, and that would be Marxism, and there's an ideology that's come before us, and that is the paganism that Muhammad adapted his ideologies from and constructed Islam. And those ideas hate us. And they are conspiring together to destroy us. They don't like each other either, but they have found a common enemy. There's a reason why Iran, every day, says death to the great Satan and death to the little Satan. The little Satan's Israel, the great Satan is us. And when I went over there, I'll tell you, they hate us. They absolutely hate us. They would gladly die if it just meant wounding one of us. Every day we walked out and we saw them looking at us, and we couldn't do anything about it because we couldn't fight until they shot first. And they studied us, and they hunted us, and they tried to kill us. They hate us. And there's a reason why they hate us. They understand something. Both Islam and Marxism has common goals. And you could read it in their writings. Their goal is to wipe out every system of religion and government that is not theirs and set up a utopia on the ashes of that which came before. There's a reason. If you ever people this week say, from the river to the sea, Palestine is free, you know what's between the river and the sea? Israel. They're not saying, we just want to have a state to ourselves, and that will make us happy. They're saying, we want Israel gone, and we want to rule it. They'd be okay with the Jews being underneath them, but they're not okay with the Jews being above them. Islam must be uppermost. 
This is what Allah tells Muhammad in the Quran and the Hadith. Why do you cry for peace when you should be uppermost? That's what he told him. Don't cry for peace. You should be the top. You should be everything. And Marx had the same idea. The world will not be at peace until the evils of democracy and capitalism are destroyed and a utopia can be erected in his image. Those are the ideas. And in the Bible, there's a really interesting prophecy in 2 Thessalonians that talks about something restraining the Antichrist and it being removed and him coming on the scene. I genuinely believe that's the church. I believe we are what is restraining these ideologies from coming to fruition. And our influence is waning. And whether it will be gone through the rapture or not, that's it. Well, how about this concept of oppression? Is that where evil comes from? Well, that's not what we see in the Bible. The first murderer is a guy named Cain. And Cain kills his brother, not because Abel oppressed him. Cain kills Abel because he is jealous of him. Satan understands this. This is from one of my favorite books, Paradise Lost, and this is Satan speaking. And he's talking about God, and he says this, Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail horrors, hail infernal world, and thou profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor. One who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. What matter where if I still be the same and what I should be but less than he whom thunder hath made greater. Here at least we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here for, uh, here for his envy will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure and in my choice to reign is worthy ambition though in hell for it is better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. What caused Satan to fall? Was it because God was oppressing him? No, it's because he wanted to be free. He didn't like the fact that God ruled him. He wanted to be the top. He wanted to be the best. That is the lie that he told Adam and Eve. You could be as gods. Where does evil come from? It comes from jealousy. It comes from envy. It comes from pride. And that pride can be wounded by oppression, but that's not where it comes from. And we need to be more nuanced in the West. Otherwise, we're going to fall into a trap. And our enemies play on that false idea. They know they didn't do this because they were oppressed, but they also know that we believe that's the case, and they play on that. Now, Another interesting thing to say about Satan. Satan cannot affect this world directly, but like I said, he can affect the thoughts. Think about this for a second. Satan, whose envious and jealous agenda has been going since history began, told Jesus that the kingdoms of the earth belong to him. What does he mean? My ideas are what rule this planet. God's does not. There's only one nation in which God's ideas ran supreme. Israel. And Satan has hated Israel ever since that became the case. And when they gave the truth of God to the world, Satan has hated them. And he has played on our predisposition to envy and jealousy. Why are the Jews so hated? Less than 0.2% of the global population. A country that is smaller than New Jersey. And all these nations want to destroy it and kill its people. Why would a guy like Hitler, who is already fighting a global war, expend so many resources to exterminate a people group? Why the hatred? And it's not just the hatred that all of us, like if we go back in our ancestry, all of our ancestors were oppressed in some way. All of our ancestors were enslaved. But the hatred of the Jews is unique, and that is, it is an exterminating ideology that chases them down. It's not just that people want to oppress the Jews, it's that people want to erase the Jews. Listen to that passage from Muhammad. The end will not come until even the rocks cry out, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. He didn't like Christians too much either, but he never said anything like that about us. 
It's because, even though the Jews are so small, they're chosen. They're chosen. And they're, the fact that they're chosen is obvious to everybody. Less than 0.2% of the population, over 20% of Nobel Prizes belong to Jews. How does that happen? Well, it's because they're a part of a culture that was built by God. I would expect it to be pretty good. Our cultures, you know, for better or for worse, we've brought Christianity into them. We've tried to allow Christianity to convert them. But our cultures have had their issues and struggles. And you know when people really start hating the Jews is when our culture starts to falter and they're doing great. When the Black Plague happened and all the Western European, Europeans were dying, whose fault was it? The Jews. Because their culture taught them to bath, to bathe, basically. And we hated them for it and we tried to kill them. Christians tried to kill them. Right? When the economy starts to falter, that is when the Jews are blamed. Jealousy, envy, and pride, once again the source of all evil, and bring to bear the wanton destruction of another people group a chosen people group. Now, I want to end this by giving a positive message, because it would be too negative if I leave it there, but then I also want to give a motivational. What, what can we do? What do we do about evil? What is the church called to do about evil? The first thing that's important to understand about evil is that evil doesn't exist in a state unto itself. It is a deprivation of good. It's like darkness. Darkness isn't a thing. You can't measure darkness. You can only measure an absence of light, which is what darkness is. Cold is not a thing. You can't measure cold. You can only measure an absence of heat. Evil is not a thing. It is merely a deprivation of good. That is why Satan has to corrupt ideologies to make them evil. He can't create anything. Only God can create. But Satan is a master at corruption. And by the way, Islam and Marxism are both Christian heresies. They were developed out of Christian nations through Christian ideologies and corrupted towards nefarious purposes. Satan is a master at corrupting that which is good. But because of that, we know, we can know, just through logic, that evil will not prevail. It says in John chapter 1 that in Jesus was light, he says, and light came into the world and the darkness could not overcome it. Darkness can't overcome light because darkness isn't a thing. It's just a deprivation of a thing. Satan can't overcome God because he's not a thing. His name literally means adversary. He has no identity except for that which is opposed to God. Satan will lose. Evil will be destroyed. Light has come into the darkness. Jesus has conquered the grave. Death has been defeated. That is the truth. We serve the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven will return. But we live on the kingdom of earth. And Christians have made two mistakes in understanding the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth. The first one is to believe the kingdom of heaven is all that matters. So therefore, the kingdoms of the earth are inconsequential. We should not even worry about them because we're, we only belong to heaven. Our citizenry is in heaven. Yeah, but you live on earth. And don't you realize that the direction of the culture affects you? Once again, we can look at our ancestors and we can blithely denounce them and say, look at these people. They were racist and sexist and all that. They lived in a culture that taught them to behave that way. It is the Christian influence that has moved us to the place where we denounce our past. What do you think happens when the culture doesn't go back but as Nietzsche warned, beyond Christianity. What do you think is happening right now? Why do you think the culture is looking the way it's looking right now? You cannot denounce your citizenship on earth. The other mistake you can make is to believe that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth are the same. This is what Muslims believe. This is why we don't understand Islam. We came there to change their political system. We thought, well, we could give them democracy and not touch Islam. Don't you realize that Islam is political? They have Sharia law. There is no such thing as a non-political Islam. Why? Because the church and the state are the same thing in their religion. 
They are the newest iteration of the Tower of Babel. One people, one system, one language. They are the newest iteration of the Tower of Babel. Why do you think even Marxism has a state-run church? This is their ideas, right? They either hollow out the institutions that are around them and they convert them to their purposes, or they destroy them altogether and erect new ones in their place. That is what they do. They're a singular system. Christians are not that way. The church has a role. We have a role in our society. Now, I love how Edmund Burke puts this. He wrote about this when the French Revolution was going on. This is the last quote, I promise. And he says this, Yet politics and the pulpit are terms that have little agreement. No sound ought to be heard in the church, but the healing voice of Christian charity. The cause of civil liberty and civil government gains as little as that of religion by this confusion of duties. Those who quit their proper character to assume what does not belong to them are for the greater part ignorant, both of the character they leave and the character they assume, wholly unacquainted with the world in which they are so fond of meddling, and inexperienced in all its affairs on which they pronounce with so little, so much confidence, they have nothing of politics but the passions that they excite. Surely, the church is a place where one day's truce ought to be announced to the dissensions and animosities of mankind. I love that quote. He's saying, I have a job. I'm not a politician. We have a job in the society. We are members of our society, and the church has a really important job. You know what our job is? We provide moral clarity for the society in which we dwell. That's what we do. And you have to realize, whenever that moral clarity comes into the world, it is naturally corrupted by it. Immediately when it goes out, it is naturally corrupted by it. And that's why we have politics. Politics are messy. They're dealing with messy issues. They're dealing with imperfect people. They're dealing with imperfect situations. We are not politicians. Some of us might be in our day job, but as the church, we're not politicians. We are there to provide moral clarity. And I love my job. I would hate to be a politician, especially in today's day and age. To deal with the situations that are going on right now is daunting on multiple different levels. But that's not my job. My job is to provide moral clarity for what we need to do to expose the evil that we must be opposed to and pronounce the good that is yet to come. That's what we're here to do. Then we seek to manifest that in our political character, but we recognize this is not the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom of heaven as best as it can be transposed on a fallen creation. Your politics cannot become synonymous with your Christianity, but your Christianity cannot be separated from your politics either. That balance has to be achieved because as worried as I am about these external forces, I am equally worried as Burke was, and rightly so, of a church that believes its solution lies in its seizing political power towards its own ends. That is something that is very easily corrupted by the wicked one towards his own purposes. So, there's more I could say about that, but I would ask you today, we're about to take communion. Today, if you had plans to tithe, if you already tithe, that's okay. If you had plans to tithe to the church, please don't. Please give to the organizations that are helping Israel right now. One is the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, the IFCJ, ifcj.org. They're providing active help on the ground for Israel. The other one is the Joshua Fund. And it's run by Joel Rosenberg. There are others out there, but please, again, it, I, I'm asking you, do not tithe to the church. We're okay. Tithe to what's going on in Israel. Please give to them. Please support what is happening in their country. Because like I said, politics is ugly, and it's not perfect in Israel either. But I'll tell you, there is a such thing as evil, and what they are up against is evil. And that clarifies things. So, as we enter into... Communion, let me, let me pray, and uh, the elders will pass out the elements, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Father, we love you. We're grateful for you. We thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to us, not in the thoughts and the wisdom of men, but through the clarity and truth that only comes through revelation declared by you. We are saved. We are becoming sanctified. We are becoming glorified, not because of our intelligence, 
not because of our strength of character, and not because of who we are as a people. Those things are happening because you have exposed us to your truth, and we have simply chosen to participate and submit to it. Lord, I pray that we would not see evil as something that only exists out there, but as something that exists in our own hearts as well, something that we must fight, something that we must deal with on a regular basis. Help us, Lord, to follow you more clearly and concisely than ever before. And Lord, I do pray for Israel. I pray that they would be able to repel the enemy that has attacked them. I pray that they would be able to dwell in peace. But more than anything, I pray that the people in Israel would begin to know you as their Lord and Savior, as their Messiah. We love you, God, and in your name, amen. So the elements are, are passed out. I want to point this out. We inherit our faith from the Jewish people. You realize when Jesus inaugurated this, what we take today, what we call the Lord's Supper, it was a part of the Passover meal. When Jesus took the bread, he was taking an element that had been passed out since the time of Moses, a flat, unleavened piece of bread that was striped and pierced. And Jesus teaches them, this is my body, broken for you. He says, all these years, you've been taking this bread, you've been meditating on the unleavened nature of God, the holy nature of God, but you've never understood why the holy nature of God is broken in your Seder meal. Like, why is it crushed? Why is it broken and distributed and eaten? And he says, the reason why is because it is me. It's always been pointing to me. And then he took a cup, a part of the Seder meal called the cup of redemption. And he said, this is my blood poured out for you, given as a ransom for many in the new covenant. So he's saying that this practice, this Jewish practice that has been happening for millennia is now being given its ultimate reason in me. So when we take these elements, we remember that our faith did not begin when Jesus rose from the dead. Our faith began at the time of Abraham, time of Moses, time of Isaac, and Aaron, and all these people we read in your Old Testament that are Jewish people. And our faith was pronounced by a Jewish Messiah, and our faith was declared by Jewish apostles. And we should be thankful that we are grafted in, as Paul puts it, a wild branch. I'm thankful for that. We should always be praying that if the rejection, and this is what Paul says, if the rejection of Israel has resulted in people like me, Gentiles, being able to come to knowledge of God, what will their redemption mean but life from the death? Right? When the Jews come back, so does Jesus. And that's why we need to be praying for that.
once again, we're so grateful for you and everything that you're doing in our lives, Lord. And even though things can look very dark, we remember and we proclaim. And taking these elements, as you said, we proclaim, we proclaim the truth that you are going to return, Lord. You are coming back to this broken world and you will set all things right. Help us in the meantime to act in ways that glorify and live faithfully under you. Help us not to live in defeatism or be paralyzed by fear, but help us to stand courageous, willing to serve you. And in your name, amen. All right, guys. So as always, uh, you, you don't have to get out of here. We, we could uh, spend the next 20, 30 minutes just hanging out, having time of fellowship. If I have